for our reading of the scripture for the sermon, we turn to the book of Romans uh, chapter 9. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. If you are a guest with us, we welcome you this morning uh, to the house of praise, to the house of prayer. Uh, and we welcome you to receive the sermon this morning. And we stand for the reading of God's word, uh, the book of Romans uh, chapter 9, and we'll begin at verse 6. Here is the reading of God's word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning. May all who have gathered today here at the chapel and those online, those listening by way of the broadcast, come to attention for the reading of God's word. The book of Romans chapter 9 beginning at verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because there are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but there also Rebecca, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not yet done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills, or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay? Or to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people. And her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. This is the reading of God's word. And the church said, Amen. And so this morning, as you continue with your notes out and your um, references to the book of Romans chapter 9, I want to continue in our sermon series and if you are a guest who's joined us this morning uh, last week we uh, took on the great uh, doctrine called the doctrine of total depravity and I seek on this Lord's Day morning uh, to continue um, on the matter of unconditional election the you in the tulip the unconditional election and we will also call it sovereign election and on the matter of sovereign election I have Three parts to the sermon on sovereign election. I will deliver the first part to you this morning. And then we will go through also the L next week. And then the I and then the P. And then we'll come back, dear friends, to the second and third part of each sermon. For I have uh, other parts also to the P. And other parts to the L. And other parts to the I. But I want to take you first through the tulip. And then uh, have a basic grounding. And then come back. I prefer calling this sovereign election because uh, sovereign election, I believe, helps us to better understand how it glorifies God. 
Sovereign election truly does glorify God. That is the case that I will make this morning. Sovereign election glorifies God. It humbles man. It initiates salvation and honors scripture. I will show that today and that without sovereign election, this is what I will show today, that without sovereign election, man cannot be saved. None can be saved. Nobody can be saved unless God, by his sovereign election, saves them. This is the case I will make today. Let us therefore begin with a definition. We will begin with understanding a definition. Let us begin with definition. Unconditional election or sovereign election. What is it? How is it defined? Well, sovereign election is defined in this manner. Uh, through the catechisms and confessions that we have uh, from the Reformation all through history. And he says, and I follow, it says as follows, and I quote, God did by his most wise and holy counsel of his own freely and unchangeably ordain some men to heaven and some men to hell by the nature of his good pleasure. Now some listening to this will already get upset may not be here today, maybe by way of the broadcast, maybe by way of the recorded format, already get upset because how, how is it possible? How is it possible, they say, that, that, that God freely and unchangeably ordains some to heaven and some to hell by, his, by, by the nature of his good pleasure? How can that be? We will, we will address that question in the sermon this morning. Well, as we begin to look at this, that God did by his most wise and holy counsel of his own freely and unchangeably ordain some men to, to heaven and some men to hell by the nature of his good pleasure. What do we mean by that? We mean that in, in eternity past, God has predestined the course of everything and everyone. He had foreordained the eternal destiny of everyone, whether to heaven or to hell, and he does all this for his glory. Men are unconditionally elected by God for His purpose without any prior works. In other words, whether they have done good or evil, it doesn't matter because it is God who does the sovereign election. Election of men rests solely on the counsel and the purposes of God. God has not decreed anything which He foresaw in the future for that would place his decree upon foreseeing something in the creature. What do I mean by that? It means that God did not look down the corridor of time and say, well, in the year 2021, there's going to be a man called John, and I see that man is going to be a good man, therefore I will elect him now for saving him in 2021. That is not how God works. When we examine total depravity, we find that, sorry, let me just finish that. That's not how God works because he doesn't look at whether the person in the front in the future is either good or bad. It doesn't depend on the work of the person. It depends entirely on God. It is God who chooses. It is God who has predestined them. When we examined the, total, the, the, the doctrine of total depravity last week, we saw that man is unable to save himself. The sinner man has no power in him to save himself. He has no faith in him to save himself. There is nothing in him that wants to say yes to God. And if you'll remember, we looked at that in Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul describes us in our pre-salvation state that we were dead to sin. We were sold to the world, the devil and the flesh. And Paul in Romans 5, 1 teaches us that man is not justified by works, nothing man can do on his own part to say that I am a Christian or I'm a believer in God, but is justified by faith. How then can a, spiritual, a spiritually dead man exercise the faith that is needed for him to be justified before God? We asked that question last week and we answer it. Where did this faith come from? Because he's spiritually dead. How can he exercise a faith in God when he's spiritually dead? Well, we answered that question and Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 8 to 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, Paul says. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is the gift of God. 
Not a result of work so that no one may boast. I think, uh, you know, God really knows uh, in, in his wisdom how men and women would respond in history. And verse 9 says, not, a res- not as a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we see that the faith that is required for salvation, the faith that is required, the saving faith, is not worked up by the sinner, does not come from the sinner, but it is a gift of God to the sinner. Saving faith is a gift of God. God gives us, gives us the faith as a gift from Him. Why? So that we cannot say that we came up with the faith. We cannot boast that we came up with the faith. We cannot boast that it is because of us we exercise this faith. We understand from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, faith is the gift of God. So we can conclude here that God gives the sinner faith to have faith. So if you and I did not have the faith that is needed to be justified before God, God, by His grace, through the Holy Spirit, gave us saving faith. And this is where we left off last week, right? This is where we were completed last week. And the statement we made at the end of the sermon last week was this. Regeneration produces faith. Faith does not produce regeneration. Regeneration produces faith. Faith does not produce regeneration. In other words, regeneration born again. That's what it means. A new life. Regeneration produces faith. Faith does not produce a born again. Does not produce a new life. Why? Because the sinner cannot exercise faith. He has no power in him to exercise faith. He is by all accounts spiritually dead. God has to begin the process in him. God has to cause him to be regenerate so that he could exercise faith in God. We made that clear last week. If you've missed that, you can go back and look at that sermon. So we see that man is unable to save himself. and That is why God saves him. God elects him for salvation. Man is unable to initiate any response to God. Therefore... Therefore, in eternity past, God elected some people to salvation. Election and predestination are unconditional. What do we mean by that? This means that they're not based on man's response because man is unable to respond. Nor does man want to respond. If you remember from the, from the scripture verses we used last week. In eternity past, God elected certain people to salvation. Where do we see that? Well, keep your bookmark on Romans 9. And go with me to um, Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we begin reading from verse 3 of Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we uh, look at verse 3. What does it say? Follow in your Bibles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then verse 4, here's the words you need to underline. Here's the words you need to highlight or put an asterisk next to. Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So we say that our salvation began really before the foundation of the world. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. Why? He says that we should show, we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. Can you see that? Not our will, not anybody else's will, but according to the purpose of His will. To the praise of His glorious grace. With which we has, He has blessed us in the Beloved. He goes on to speak about in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Nothing on our part. Which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, 
Ephesians 1 makes it very clear to us today that God knew in advance who he is going to save. In Acts chapter 2, for example, I'm not asking you to turn there right now. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were saved, right? Peter gets up and he preaches. 3,000 were saved. But we ask the question, were there only 3,000 people who listened to Peter preach? Were there only 3,000 people who listened to, pre to, to Peter preach? No, certainly not. Historically, we know it is estimated that there were over 250,000 people in Jerusalem at that time. You will remember they came from outside of Jerusalem. They, all, they came to the feast that was happening there. And so it was the, the, the town, the city was filled with people who came from the outside that come especially for the feast. So historically, it's been recorded that there were over 250,000 people who came to the feast. So I think it's fair to assume that more than 3,000 people were present when they heard Peter preach. More than 3,000 people were present. And I believe, just like um, uh, we find, I was talking to my brother the other day, whether it was uh, Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield, it is recorded that when they preached, they did not need a microphone, that their voices that God had endowed them with such power from on high, that when they preached, their voice carried for over a mile. That means a person a mile away could clearly hear the call of salvation. Maybe that was what God blessed Peter would on the day that 250,000 people who gathered there could hear God's word being proclaimed. So we make the point here today that 3,000 were saved, but surely not only 3,000 heard, more than 3,000 heard, but did God save all of them? No, we have a specific amount of people. God saved 3,000. He didn't save the others. In Acts, in Acts chapter 13 verse 48, we read, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Did everybody believe? Certainly not. Was everybody saved at the preaching of the gospel? Certainly not. Luke makes it clear in the book of Acts, it is only those who were appointed to believe were saved. Now we must ask the question, who appointed them to believe? Who appointed them to believe? Well, the next uh, verse in your study tells you, John chapter 6, verse 44. We heard this last week. We know who appointed them. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So we know now who has appointed him. Unless the Father draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. That's what Jesus says. No man, nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is sovereign election. This is unconditional election. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Are you with me so far? But then, even as we, before, we produce, before we progress any further, some will say, well, God is unfair. God is unfair, preacher. The God that you serve, the God that you speak about is unfair for how can we, how can he save some and not save others? They say, how could God elect some to salvation and elect others to eternal damnation? They say, how can a loving God, a loving God allow people to go to hell? They say that we're teaching a salvation that is unfair and salvation that is unjust and we're teaching a God that is unloving. They say that the God that they worship is fair and is just and is loving. And we're, and we're preaching a God that is unfair, unjust and unloving. Why? Because he elects some to heaven, he elects some to salvation and others to eternal damnation. Even when preaching in the public square, uh, we often are reminded by the sinner. It's like we don't even know this. The sinner has to remind us. We are reminded by the sinner. It says that, hey preacher, do you not know that God is love? Yes, God is love. Indeed, God is love. 
But the love of God is not separate from his other attributes. The love of God is not elevated above his other attributes. God is love. God is mercy. God is just. God is righteous. God is judgment. The more accurate way to convey the attributes of God and the character of God is to remember that God is holy, right? That is the more accurate way to present the, the, the attributes of God. Remember the angels in heaven, when they cry out before the Lord God Almighty, they don't cry out, love, love, love. What do they cry out? Holy, holy, holy. So all of this comes under the, the, the holiness of God. And we would go astray by elevating one character and attribute of God above the other. But let us understand why the world, let us dig a little deeper and understand why the world and so many Christians fail to understand this matter of sovereign election. Well, for example, they will say to us the go-to scripture, the default scripture is John chapter 3 verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you not see this preacher in your very own Bible that whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. That God so loved the world, God so loved everybody that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. They also quote 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 that says, God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Can you see, preacher, how wrong you are? Because Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Does he not say that God desires all people to be saved? But yet you are saying that God only saves some people and not everyone? Surely this means that God loves all men and surely he does not want all men to perish in hell and he wants all men to be saved, right preacher? But we will answer those questions. We will answer every one of those questions. Some of them may be answered this morning, some of them may be answered in part two and part three, but we will answer those questions. And they're actually pretty easy answers when we look at it. As you prepare for the second part of the sermon and the third part of the sermon where we will deal with John 3.16, and how John 3.16 needs to be rightly, rightly read. For John 3.16, when it is read this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, is the wrong way of reading it. John 3.16 should be read this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that all the believing ones should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the correct way to read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all the believing ones should not perish but have everlasting life. And I'll show you how we get to that conclusion of how to read that when we come to part two and part three of the sermon. And that is why when you hear me speak in the public square, I'm very careful when I quote John 3.16. I'm very careful when I speak it. And so we find that um, as you prepare your own hearts, as you go and do your own reading and read commentaries on John 3.16, you'll find that uh, when, when, when we speak of God's love for the world, uh, does God love the world in the same way that he loves the church? We could ask the question right now as you prepare. Does God love the world the same way does he love the church? Because if you look at John 3.16 and God's love for the world, everybody in the world or the people of the world, does he love everybody the same does he love the sinner the same as the saint? The answer is no, he doesn't. Because God cannot love the sinner the same way that he loves the saint. There is a unique, special, specific love for the saint, for the, for the church, that is marvelously more beautiful and special than his love for the sinner. Why? Because what he sees in the, in the saint, what he sees in the church is the object of his love. And the object of his love is not you, but the one who is in you, Jesus Christ. He loves his son. It is his son that is in you. That he, that's the object of his love. And so that makes his love for the church more special and unique than his love for the sinner. 
And what did Jesus? And, and we find, and I'll show you proof of that as we get to that text. And uh, as 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 Jesus appears before the the three great prophets, and uh, John the Baptist and Moses and Elijah, what do they hear from heaven? This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. This is what they hear, showing God's great love and affection for His Son Jesus Christ. And so I prepare you for part two and part three of the sermon which I believe will be greatly helpful for you. Now let's just pick up the picture. Let's just pick this up and go to Romans 9. So let's go back to Romans 9. Romans 9 helps us understand this more clearly. And it's the case of Jacob and Esau. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And he begins from verse 1 in that way. And then verse 6 it says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all the children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. I just want to just stop right there and just go on to offshoot at a little moment. One of the ways you can deal with a, uh, you can deal with a Muslim when it comes to them saying that their, their, their Muhammad is a prophet, you must ask, by what account or by what reasoning is he a prophet? How was he called a prophet? Well, he can't be called a prophet because he's not in the line of prophets. He's not in the line of promise. Remember, he's not the child of promise. The, 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 the prophetic line comes through the child of promise. It comes not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. So Muhammad comes through the line of Ishmael and there is no prophetic line through Ishmael. There is a prophetic line through, through Isaac and therefore Muhammad cannot be called a prophet except that he named himself a prophet. Whereas if you look through the line of Isaac, you can clearly see the prophetic line. Therefore they are called prophets. And so we find that uh, verse 9 says, For this is what was promised, about this time next year I will return and Sarah will, shall have a son. And not only so, but also uh, when Rebekah has conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, uh, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order, that the, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. What do we make with this text? What do we do with this? God making clear that I love one and I hate the other? Look at verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, he says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will. Uh -huh. It depends not on human will or exertion. Exertion means here works. So it depends not on human will or works of man, but on God. And he says, on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this reason, I, for this very purpose, I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whoever, whoever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, this is the one of the key texts to understanding sovereign election. It's one of the key texts to understanding unconditional election. And to answering those who say that God is unfair. Here Paul lays it out clearly. He does not avoid the question. He gets straight into it by the inspiration of the Spirit. Uh, and he brings it to our understanding. And the way he goes about teaching this lets us know that even in his day, people had a problem with this. Even in his day, people were saying God is unfair and unjust. Even in his day, they had a problem understanding it. And that is why he says in verse 14, if he says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? He's actually asking the question they're asking. He's posing the question that they're posing. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? So they clearly had a problem in understanding this. When I say they, I don't mean Paul. I mean the people that were listening. And so do many people today have a problem in understanding. I myself even had a problem at one stage in understanding this by asking the question, is God unjust is God unfair but if we follow Paul here if we follow how he sets this out we will see that this is 
what it really is. It is God who sovereignly chooses. It is God who is fair. It is God who is just. It is God who is loving. For if not for sovereign election, nobody will be saved. We must be clear on that. Every man born into the world is born in sin. He's totally depraved. He does not want to know God. So if God kept quiet and did nothing, nobody will be saved. Why? Because man cannot initiate faith in God. He cannot and he does not want to because he's spiritually dead, right? Spiritually dead man can do nothing to draw near to God unless God does something. What does God do? He sovereignly elects those to salvation. And so we find it is loving then of God. Loving, it is loving of God to extend election, to extend his sovereign grace to sinners, to sinners who do not deserve his grace. So what does he do? He chose Isaac over Ishmael. He chose Jacob over Esau. It's God's choice. And some might be listening and said, oh yes, pastor, but uh, yes, we see that. The text tells us that. But we see it, they say we see it as God looking down the corridor of time and God saw that Ishmael's life and Esau's life and because he saw their life down the corridor of time, he chose one over the other by how they would respond in the future. So God chose Jacob over Esau and Isaac over Ishmael because of how they would respond in the future. These folks say God looks ahead and sees what they're going to do and how they're going to respond. And because of his foreknowledge of them, because he knows in advance what they're going to say, because of what they're going to say and what they're going to do, then he chooses them. Well, that's why he chooses them. But that's not it, is it? Romans 9 doesn't tell us that. Paul says that before Jacob and Esau were born, Before they were even born, when they did not know how to do good or evil, the text tells us that before they were even born, God chose Jacob and not Esau. So there's their argument gone out the window. You see, it's not a question of man's character or his work. It's not a question of what man may do. It's not a question of whether he's going to be good or bad. It's not a question of whether he's going to do good or evil. While these boys, while these twin boys, Jacob and Esau, were in their mother's womb, God chose to bless Jacob and accept him and to reject Esau and to allow him to remain under the Adamic sin. The sin to which he was born in. Well, some may say he foreknew. Again, I'm going back to the point. Some may say he foreknew that Jacob would be a good man. God saw in advance that Jacob would be a good man and that Esau would be a bad man. Therefore, God chose Jacob, right? They would say that. But no, God didn't do that. And we have proof from our text. If you read the the record very clearly, you will see that in many ways, Esau was a much better man than Jacob. If we had our own choice, if we were in the choosing, we would choose Esau over Jacob any time. Why? Because Jacob was a schemer. (laughs) Jacob was a swindler. Jacob was a rascal. Jacob was a usurper, always working underhandedly to see what advantage he could take of the various situations he faced, even taking advantage of people. And he did this all his life. But yet God chose him and rejected the his brother Esau. So God didn't choose them because one of them was better than the other. Both were equally depraved. Both equally fell into total depravity. Both were sinners. Both were equally lost. Yet God chose to save Jacob and not Esau. Therefore he says, Jacob I've loved. Esau I hate it. Verse 10 confirms this most crucial point. Verse 10 says, not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done anything good or evil. That's what I said a few minutes ago. Can you see that? 
in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. So it says then, it says then in this text that even before the children were born to prove whether they were good or evil, whether they were going to obey or disobey, God sovereignly elected one to salvation and the other not to salvation. This is God's choosing, dear friends in Christ. And man has no part in it. This is God's choosing. This is God's sovereign election. This is unconditional election. When we consider Sarah and Abraham, they couldn't have children. She was barren. And, and in their old age, she gave birth not through anything they did, but through God empowering them to be pregnant and to have Isaac. Isaac is the promise, not of the flesh, that is, not, of, not because he was born of Abraham, but because he was chosen by God. Can you see that? Ishmael, Ishmael was also born of the flesh, but he's not the child of promise, like you heard me say a few minutes ago. Why? Because he's not God's choice. Ishmael is God's choice. God sovereignly chose Ish, uh, sorry, Isaac, yeah. Isaac is God's choice. God sovereignly chose him before Abraham and Sarah came together. As you ponder this, as you think about this, so did Paul's audience in his day. So he answers in verse 4 by saying and repeating the, what I said a few minutes ago. What shall, sorry, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And he answers and says, by no means. He asks the question and he immediately answers. He doesn't leave any room for wiggling. He doesn't leave any room for commentary or comment or sarcasm or somebody to think about it. He says, certainly not. And we can say today, as we ask the question, is there injustice on God's part? Certainly not. Why? Because it doesn't fit with his character. Injustice, unfair, doesn't fit with his character. Paul makes it clear that there is no injustice with God. There is no unfairness with God. God has been and always will be fair and just. It is not within his character to be unfair and unjust. As many people ask, how can God be unjust and send people to hell? Consider this question, my dear friends. The question we're asked is this, and I get this question all the time, and I understand when people feel emotional about this. The question is asked like this. How can God be unfair and unjust and elect some to salvation and others to not? Tell me, tell me, how can God do that? I said, that is not the right question. That is not the right question. The right question is this. How can God love me so much that he saved me? How can God love a sinner so depraved, so wretched that he can save us? That's the right question to ask. It is God's sovereign choice. God made the decision to elect us. We do not deserve the salvation of God. We do not deserve the life that we have. We deserve hell because of the wretched sinners that we are. We deserve hell not because we sin or we, we practice sin, but because sin is in us. We're sinful on the outside because we're sinners on the inside. There are marvelous Ways to understand and come to terms with the, the character of God. His ways are above our ways when we think about it, right? Deuteronomy 32.4 says, The rock, his, his work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. So we know it's not within his character to be unjust. Psalm 119 verse 137, righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Psalm 119 verse 142, 142 your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. Psalm 145 verse seven, 17 says, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and in all his deeds. So we must be clear that, 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 that man is far inferior in trying to understand this. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so the ways, so, so my ways, God says, my ways 
are higher, are above your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So Paul says then, there is no injustice with God. And he drives this home by saying, by no means. By no means. He's making it clear, by no means. And if you have a different translation, it will say, may it never be. Let it be settled. May it never be that there is, there is no injustice with God. Here Paul is saying a thousand times over, no, no, no. And he's safeguarding us even today for even thinking in a way that God is unfair. Because to think that God is unfair, to think that God is unjust would be thinking against his character and attribute and that would be a blasphemy on our part. But let's progress a little further. Let's try to understand this a little further. Look at verses 15 to 18. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whoever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You may have already got it, and you may, I may not need to explain any further, but for the purpose of us all, let's be clear. Let's progress a little further. Let's try to explain this. Paul refers to God's word to Moses here in verse 15. He says, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And what he's doing is quoting Exodus 33, especially verse 19 of Exodus 33. I don't have time this morning and I'm not going to go back to it, but you should study it in ready, readiness for your Bible study. In Exodus 33 verse 19, it's the account, it's a very helpful account to help us to remember when God said this to Moses at a particular time in history. In that particular context, um, it has to do with Israel at Mount Sinai. Moses had been up the mountain with God, getting the law of God, and he'd been there 40 days and for 40 nights, if you remember. And while he was up on the mountain, down at the foot of the mountain, at the foot of the mountain, Aaron and some of the leaders of Israel listened. He listened to the request. They listened to the request of the people, and they decided to make their own God and to worship the God that they create with their hands. Where has Moses gone? Why is he taking so long? Where is our God? We're in the wilderness. We were better off in Egypt, blah, 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 so forth, so on. They began ranting and raving. Make us a God. Aaron buckled under pressure. So did the other leaders. What did they do? Ignoring all the mighty acts of God. Ignoring the fact that God had parted the Red Sea for them. God had intervened so supernaturally that he caused the laws of science to come to a standstill. Tides worked against themselves that God may allow his people and bring his people through the Red Sea on dry land. Ignoring all of the mighty acts of God in the plagues of Egypt to set them free from Pharaoh's hard heart. Ignoring all of that, they came to the point of idolatry, making up their own God. And even as they were uh, in, at the foot of the mountain, it's not like they didn't know what was happening at the top of the mountain. Because at the top of the mountain, there was a thundering. There was an earthquake. And God was talking to Moses. So that the people could know that God was talking to Moses. And they could see all of this. Yet, they had such an idolatrous heart. Make us a, a God, they claimed. And so they collected all the jewelry in the camp and melted it with the help of Aaron, and they made a golden calf. Then the people began to dance around this calf, dance around the golden calf, just as the pagans of the land had done. And they were dancing around the calf in a voluptuous riot, in a sense of sensuality. They were stripping off their clothes to the point of nakedness, and running around this God that they created, and worshipping this God in the most horrible heathen idolatry. Moses comes down from the mountain with the law in his hands. He was tremendously angry. He was furious. He smashed the law in pieces and went up on to the top of the mountain again. What we find in the chapters is God was angry with these people. And rightly so. God was angry with these people. But Moses began to intercede and God pointed out that even Moses could not intercede for a people like this. 
Israel had lost every mark of any possible claim that they had upon God. They had forfeited every possible right they thought they had. What did God do? God retreated upon his own sovereignty. God went back to his own sovereignty. And he said to Moses in Exodus chapter 33 verse 19. And I'm paraphrasing this. I will bless whom I bless. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And I will show compassion to whom I want to show compassion. That's what he says to Moses. The only hope. What do we, what do we get from that? The only hope that Israel had of escaping the absolute just and right doom that they deserved. The doom and wrath that was hanging over them. The only hope that they had of, es- of escaping this was God's sovereign choice. It was God who decides what happens to them. God's choice. To show forth his wrath or not. God's choice to show whom he will have mercy on. And whom he will not have mercy on. And so he says it's not according to man's will. But how God's will. Or how God wills that this take place. Verses 19 to 29 says. You will say then why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded, say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter not right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath repaired for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? And even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And all who was not beloved, I'll call beloved. And in every place where it has been said, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And so what is the point he's driving forward here today is that, is that God will call these people. It's God's sovereign choice. That those people who are not my people shall be called my people. That means those people outside of Israel, the Gentiles, the heathens who will come. It it is God who would call them. And God continues to do that. And that is why John 14, 12, when uh, um, Jesus says that greater works will I do. uh, The Pentecostal charismatics and the word of faith people, well, they say, well, we can do all these miracles because see, Jesus said that we will do greater works. Uh, you will do greater works than these. And I was sharing with one man the other day who was trying to make a case for that. And I said to him, my dear brother, let me take time to explain this to you. Because he was talking about the great miracles of a false prophet called uh, Otto Roberts, who we clearly know as a false prophet. And those who come uh, after him and the Kenneth Hagans and the Creflo Dollars and all of these people who teach their congregations that, listen, we can do greater miracles than Jesus. Because look, John 14, 12 says, you will do greater than me. Well, my dear friends, as I said to him, that uh, it is not about the extent of miracles. Because nobody can do greater than Jesus. Miracles. Even the apostles could not walk on water. Jesus walked on water, right? Could the apostles walk on water? No. Did God use the apostles to do miracles? Yes. But they did no greater than Jesus. But yet we have people today saying we can do greater miracles than Jesus. It's a blasphemy. But it's a blessing that comes, of, uh, comes from a misunderstanding of the text. So what does Jesus mean when he says you will do greater than these? He was talking about the extent of the preaching of the kingdom. He's talking about the extent of his reach beyond Jerusalem, beyond Israel, to the ends of the earth. What did he tell his disciples in the book of Acts? He says you will go from this place to that place. Right? You will go from the inside To the outside. And this is what Isaiah is talking about. God is talking through Isaiah saying that God will bring a people who are not my people. To be his people. And that's even happening to this day. So is is John 14, 12 being fulfilled? Yes. How? Because we take the gospel to a greater extent geographically than Jesus did in his time. That's what John 14, 12 means. It doesn't mean greater miracles. It means greater reach of the gospel. Greater reach of salvation to those Uh, To come to Jesus Christ. And we see that continuously taking place. By many people of many tribes and tongues and nations. uh, Turning to Jesus Christ. 
So Paul is driving the point home further here. He's driving the point home by saying that God, who is the potter, can do with the clay, which is mankind, whatever he desires. That's clear to understand. God, who is the potter, can do with the clay, mankind, as he pleases. He is the potter. God is the potter. Man is the clay. And the clay, which is man, does not have the right to question the potter, who is God. He says in verse 20, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Really? Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? How dare you? God does not owe us any explanation. You see, in our worship of God, we have to understand what reverence is. God does not owe us any explanation. He is God. We are sinful creatures, unworthy of anything. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Paul gives us here, the, is what the, the answer Paul gives us here is the answer that God wants us to hear today. That's it. Nothing more. Whatever we find here is what God wants us to know. Nothing more. God doesn't want us to know any more than that. Who are you to demand more? You're nobody. We are nobody. We bow in humble reverence to God and say, God, whatever you've given us in this word is all that we so treasure from you. A theologian by the name of Carl Henry uh, was born in 1913 and he died in 2003. And he writes concerning the matter of what I speak about. He writes on this last few seconds what I've said. He writes this and I quote, Christians need always to remember this, that revelation is God's gracious self-disclosure in which he lovingly forfeits his own personal privacy so that his, his sinful creatures might know him, end quote. God forfeits his own private nature to tell us his will. He doesn't have to do it. He's God. He owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. Everything we have that we have in our word is God's will to us, revealed to us, that is revealed from his own private nature. He tells us how the world was created in Genesis chapter 1. He tells us how the world is going to be uncreated and the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. He does not have to tell us any of that. But yet he has told us. In other words, what we have in the form of the Bible, we should be thankful for. We should not take on the position of pride and arrogance and think that it's our right in some way to know more than what he's already told us. So here God has given us an answer. Let me press on, friends. I, I, I don't want to take this part one into a separate part. Let me finish this. So here God gives us an answer. God says, I act according to my sovereign will in Romans 9. But we also learn from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6, that there is another reason why God acts. Keep your bookmark there and go to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 3 to verse 6. So God acts according to his sovereign will. But there's another reason why he acts. In verse 3 to verse 6, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And so we've done that. We've seen that, we've seen that God has chosen us before the foundation of the world. God has predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, Right? His sovereign will, his sovereign election. But look at verse 6. For what are the, for what are the reason? To the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glorious grace. And the church must say, Amen. For the praise of his glorious grace. It's about him and not about us. Salvation does not glorify man, but glorifies God. Let us not fall into the trap, my dear friends. And we must be careful in how we speak about those who become Christians and those who, we, who are born again. Help me not to fall into the trap as we preach by faith every week in the public square that somebody may come to salvation, that we would boastfully one day say, see, I led that man to Christ. Have you heard people speak that way? It was I who led him to Christ. It was brother so-and-so and John so-and-so and person so-and-so who led that person to Christ. Let us not fall into that trap, my friends, because no man can lead a man to Christ except Christ himself. It is God who chooses and God who leads the man to salvation. 
not mankind. And why? Because it's not about us, but for the praise of His glorious grace. For the praise of His glorious grace. God saved the sinner for the praise of His glorious grace. God elected the man to salvation for the praise of His glorious grace. Again, man finds this an unfair character of God. You may ask, the sinner man may ask, why didn't God give me a chance to prove that I'm worthy of salvation? How can God make up his mind about me without giving me an opportunity to live my life to prove that I'm worthy of salvation? So the man sees the sovereignty of God as unfair then. Yet the same man who sees God as unfair is the same man who exercises sovereignty in his life. Nobody questions his sovereignty. For example, you, nobody questions your sovereignty. But yet you see God as unfair. Nobody calls you unfair in your sovereignty. But you may say, but what do you mean, pastor? Let me give you a couple of examples. Does a gardener have the right to dig up a bush and to throw it away? Yes, he does. It's his garden. It's his plant. If he doesn't like it, he can put it in the bin. He can put it in the green bin and send it off for recycling or whatever. Does he have the right to pick up a plant here, dig it up and take it to the other side of the garden and plant it there? Yes, he does. It's his garden. He has the right. He's sovereign over it. Nobody questions it. Nobody says you're unfair about this. Does anyone challenge his right? No, nobody challenges it. If a farmer has cattle, does he have the right to divide the cattle and say a certain number is to go to the market to be slaughtered and a certain number is to be kept for two or three more years? Does anybody have a right to question him? No, he's sovereign over his affairs. When a fly comes into your home, do you have the right to swat it? Or do you have the right to shoo it away? Yes, you can do whatever you like. It's your right. You're sovereign over it. Kill the fly. Shoot the fly away. Nobody's going to say you're unfair about it. But yet, that same man calls God unfair in God's sovereignty. God, we understand that you're sovereign, but you're unfair in your sovereignty. To deny God's sovereignty is to deny his godhood. And to make God man in God's place. We do not want to do that. May the Lord help us from doing that. We'll put a disclaimer in before we finish the sermon today. We'll put a disclaimer in and we'll say, well, some say, well, Paul is a difficult man to understand, right? Well, that's what people say. When we talk about the argument of uh, male and female roles in the church, when we talk about the 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 topic of uh, uh, leadership in the home and in the church. Paul will say, said, many will say, well, we don't want to hear about Paul. Let's talk about Jesus. We don't want to hear what Paul says. Let's talk about that argument in itself is foolish. We don't even try to entertain it. But for the sake of bringing them from their place of ignorance to the place of understanding, we sometimes submit to open the door to bring them in and say, okay, you don't believe what Paul says? You don't believe what Paul says about this? Would you be okay if I quoted Jesus? How about that? Is that okay? Can I tell you what Jesus said? Oh, yeah, yeah, we want to know. Red letter words. Tell us what Jesus said. Okay, no problem. John chapter 6, verse 44. Would you like that verse? Let's read it. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Boom. Finished. The words of Jesus. Jesus himself said, are you calling Jesus unfair then? No, you can't. This is what Jesus says. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, as, as I come to the end, is the doctrine of unconditional election, the doctrine of sovereign election. As I can, come to the conclusion of the sermon, I want to quote a Bible teacher who provides probably the, the most pretty useful summation of what I said today. He writes, and I quote, please follow, it's not going to be on the screen. He says the following. In spite of the clarity with what scripture addresses this topic, Many professing Christians today struggle in their acceptance of God's sovereignty, especially when it comes to his electing work in salvation. Their most common protest, of course, is that the doctrine of election is unfair. But with such objection stems from a human idea of fairness, rather than the objective divine understanding of true justice. In order to appropriately address the issue of election, we must set aside all human considerations and focus instead on the nature of God and His righteous standard. Divine justice is where the discussion must begin. And he speaks by talking about what is divine justice. 
Well, simply stated, it is an essential attribute of God whereby He infinitely, perfectly, and independently does exactly what He wants to do, when He wants to do it, and how He wants to do it. Because He is the standard of justice, the very definition of justice, then whatever He does is inherently just. Therefore, God defines for us what justice is because He is by nature just and righteous. And what He does reflects His nature. His own free will and nothing else is behind his justice. This means that whatever he wills is just. Whatever he wills is right. Not because of any external standard of justice, but simply because of what he wills as justice. And when we speak of external standard, we mean that nothing you and I may think about justice. He doesn't take anything what you and I think about justice into consideration. And rightly so, he shouldn't. Because he's God. He's altogether intrinsically, that means internally, right and just and perfect. To say that election is unfair is not only inaccurate, it fails to recognize the very essence of true fairness. That which is fair and right and just is that which God wills to do. Therefore, if God wills to choose those whom he would save, it is inherently fair for him to do it. We cannot impose our ideas of fairness upon God. Or our ideas, our understanding of fairness upon God. Instead, we must go to the scriptures and to see how God himself in his perfect righteousness decides how to act and when to act. While many contend that election is a dangerous doctrine to be feared and not listened to, people like William Tyndale, for example, said he held held the opposite view. He believed and made clear that this divine truth emboldens the preacher Because it ensures the ultimate success of his preaching ministry. No matter how hardened man's heart may be, Tyndale insisted that sovereign election guarantees the reception of the gospel. He said, when Christ is preached, the hearts of them which are elected and chosen begin to wax soft and melt at the bounteous mercy of God. End quote. What does it mean? It means that this is the assurance that we have, my friends. That we will step out next Saturday to preach the gospel to the vast multitude of sinners in Bristol. With this in mind, that God has an elect people that he will save. And that is most comforting to me. That is most comforting to me. Because to imagine, to think for yourself that nobody deserves the favor of God, nobody deserves the mercy of God, that all sinners deserve hell, and should they die today and go to hell, they deserve hell. But we go to the public square with this comfort in our heart that God says if we preach the gospel, that he will save those whom he has elected before the foundation of the world. That is a comfort to me. It is heartwarming to me. So I don't see it as unfair or unjust. I see it as greatly encouraging that the mercy of God may be demonstrated to those whom he has elected before the foundation of the world for salvation. It would be easier, my friends, if you say, then why should we preach? The common question we will get asked by those who oppose this doctrine is, if God has elected those who he wants to be saved before the foundation of the world, and nothing you do can affect that decision, because it's God's decision, right? If God has elected them for salvation, there's nothing you or anyone else can do To stop him from being saved. So in other words, if God has elected for a rapist to be saved and come to salvation, nobody can stop that. In the same way God has elected you to be saved, there are many people who would disagree with your salvation. Who? God saved you? You deserve hell, they say to you, right? Why? Because they know your past, they know your drunkenness, they know your addictions, they know the way you used to speak, they know all that about you. And then when you say you saved, they say, you saved? How can God save you? You say, then you must say truly. I don't know how God saved me. I don't deserve to be saved. I'm saved by God's sovereign choice. I had no part to play in this. I deserve hell like every sinner. But God, by his sovereign grace, saved me. And so we go into the city of Bristol. It would be easier, my friends. And Charles Spurgeon said this. Charles Spurgeon said that... uh, Sorry, let me go back to the question. The question was, if, 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 if God saved those to be saved, then surely he'll bring them to salvation at any time. So why preach the gospel? Why, why, why go out and tell people? Well, there are three main reasons. One, God commands us to preach, and so we must preach. The same Jesus who said, 
you cannot come to God unless God the Father calls you. Is the same Jesus who said that we need to go and preach, right? So that's clear. We need to go and preach. No questions asked. Obey him. And that God would use the preaching of the gospel to bring his elect to salvation. It's God's glorious process. We don't know who the elect are. Nobody knows who the elect are. Charles Spurgeon said in one of his uh, uh, commentaries and his, in his uh, sermons, he said, if, if God would only paint a yellow stripe on the back of everyone whom he elected before the foundation of the world, then we will go straight to them and preach the gospel. How easy that would be, right? But God has not done it so. Why? Because in this glorious process of preaching the gospel, God is glorified. And we get to have the great honor of proclaiming Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and to see God's sovereign elect come to salvation. God has made us part of the process of the sovereign elect coming to him. God has made us part of the process of bringing those who we chose before the foundation of the world to come to salvation. As we go out into Bristol on Saturday, who will know? Maybe the homosexual, the Muslim, the agnostic, the evolutionist, the atheist, the Jehovah's Witness has been the one that's been named before the foundation of the world. And God has given us, my dear friends, Spirit of Life Church, the honor, the privilege of being a part of that process. That the one who's called before the foundation of the world can come to salvation. How marvelous that is. Who are we that God would use us? But he's made us a part of that process. So how should we respond to this? My question to you today is how should we respond to this? Well, I think there should be an immediate response of worship on the part of all the believers in Christ. On your part and mine, in the pulpit and in the pews. Why? Because to think that God would sovereignly choose, save me. That he would, he would bypass another and come to me. And I, and I say, my friends, that it is God's choice. I, it's, not, it's not fault of your own. It's God's choice that he chose you and left another and saved you. Your choice, your response then should be, to worship Him, to glorify Him, to honor Him. This is my response, and I hope it will be yours too. Let us pray.